Yeah. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Who do I think I am is a title of my guest book today, Stories of Chola Wishes and Caviar Dreams. Now, I'm going to ask you when we get into this, <laughs> what does what does Chola mean? <laughs> did I get it right? You did. You did. It was borderline. You almost missed it. But I was like, okay, I'm going to have to explain what that is for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do this uh, intro properly and then we'll, I'll ask you okay. that in a second. Okay. Uh, Angela Johnson Reyes is her name. Now, for those of you that don't know who she is, she's probably like one of the most sold out comedians going around today. As she says, that is before COVID, but I'm sure she'll pick that up uh, when COVID sort of subsides. We're all waiting for that to happen. She's actually been in quite a few movies and TV shows, and she's voiced one of a character in a movie that is literally my favorite, The Book of Life. I'm probably taking it back quite a few years there. Honestly, it is one of my favorite movies and I had no idea uh, until just recently, which is honestly incredible. Uh, Angela, you're also a a pretty well-known comedian, as I said before, but can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today? Thank you. Thank you for having me all across the world. Thank you so much for being here. Very much looking forward to unboxing your incredible story because I know it's probably like, all over the place and you've got a lot of stories I can imagine uh, from your life. Um, My very first question for you though, before we get into Chola wishes and caviar dreams uh, is what does success look like for you? Well, it looks different in different seasons of life. I, I believe that we have to define success before we pursue it. Otherwise we'll just be running around aimlessly and nothing ever suffices. Nothing satisfies, nothing works. Nothing is it. Um, you never arrive. Uh, so I think in every goal, you got to define success in every season of life. You got to define success. Um, currently I would say for me, success looks like me being at peace and doing what I love. Um, if I get to do what I love and be at peace and be able to provide for my family, that looks like success to me. Um, so that's currently where I stand with success. What does peace really look like to you? Are you able to describe that? Yeah. Uh, no anxiety. Um, that's number one. Um, happiness. I feel happy. I feel, uh, like the world can be in chaos and I'm just fine in the midst of it. Um, somebody can throw a wrench in, in my day and I'm fine. I can roll with the punches, you know, I can adjust when I'm in that state of mind and state of being where I can adjust with what's happening in the world and in my life. And I feel happy and And all of that, I think that looks like peace to me. Have you had many days more recently or even in the past that have sort of thrown wrenches right at you and made your day challenging? Oh, sure. Sure. Especially, I mean, touring and being in the entertainment industry and, you know, it's like nothing's guaranteed in this industry, you know, Um, so yeah, I mean, I could list many days that I've had uh, a wrench thrown in it. What do you do when those wrenches are thrown? Um, well, depending on the situation, but typically I I reach out for help. Is it something that my husband can help me with? Is it something my managers can help me with? It's like, what do we do? It definitely is team effort for sure. It's like, hey, what do we do next? What the show got canceled? What do we do? I thought I booked this role and turns out they're recasting me with somebody else. What do we do? You know what I mean? Like it's constantly just being like, okay, redirect, reassess, whatnot. Did you always see yourself doing this sort of career? Um, You know, when I was younger, I wanted to be an actress, but I didn't... I I felt like I I might as well say I want to be a princess because it was so far-fetched, you know, like the audacity I have to say something like I want to be an actress. What did I know about being an actress? Nothing. Um, 
So it felt very far fetched, but I would sit in front of the mirror and like try to make myself cry. And I would like give my award speeches in front of the mirror. And I would like practice like modeling poses in front of the mirror. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Um, But yeah. So when I was younger, I mean, I wanted to be all kinds of things. I wanted to be a lawyer for a while, but turns out I don't want to be a lawyer. I want to play a lawyer on TV one day. (laughs) Um, I, I don't want to actually be a police detective, but I would love to play one on TV one day. You know what I mean? Like it's those kinds of things. Like when I was younger, I wanted to be all these things. And it turns out, Oh, I think I just want to be an actress and pretend to be all these things. And so what eventually stuck for you in terms of comedy, what made you stay with it? and acting so um i took a joke writing class at a church and this was it's not your typical how i became a comedian story but (laughs) i was not trying to be a comedian i was going to this church and every tuesday night they would do creative arts night they would have acting classes dancing classes and there was a woman there teaching a joke writing stand-up comedy class And so I took her class and one of the first jokes that I wrote blew up on the internet, this nail salon bit. And it was this brand new thing called YouTube that just blew up like crazy. And so that started taking off. People wanted me to perform all over the world. Like, Hey, when are you coming to Australia? When are you coming to the Philippines? When are you coming here, there, there? And I was like, Oh man, all I have is these like 12 minutes that I wrote in a free joke writing class at church. I guess I better write some more material. Um, so I still was like fighting being a comedian. I didn't want to be a comedian. I was like, oh no, I'm an actress. I just do comedy for fun. I'm an actress. Meanwhile, I haven't booked anything. I just keep saying I'm an actress. Um, and then it all shifted for me. This is back in MySpace days. And I got a message on MySpace from someone. They were like, hey, can you come and perform at this Mormon holiday party? And I was like, oh, I'm not Mormon. And they're like, oh, no, you don't have to be Mormon. Just do a clean set, which clean set means no cussing. Don't talk about sex or drugs or anything like that. And I was like, oh, I could do that. So I go to this Mormon holiday party and I do my clean set. Turns out it's actually a competition. They got about 10 other comics to show up. And it was a, you know, right, buddy? My dog just had surgery today and he's still feeling a little loopy. He looks at me drunk like this. Um, anyway, so it was a comedy competition and I ended up tying for first place and I won $600. And that was the most money I had ever made in my entire life at the time. Like I had in 10 minutes of comedy, I can make $600. And so it was in that moment that I was like, wait, I think I'm going to be a comedian. Maybe I should try to do that. And that's when it all shifted for me when I made $600. Did you find it tricky to do a clean set at all? No, no, because that's kind of how I operated anyway in my life. You know, Uh, at the time when I was just getting started in stand-up, I didn't really say cuss words too much. I didn't really talk about nasty things, you know, now it's a different story. (laughs) Now now she's a, uh, evolved. Um, I like to say I've evolved into fungula. Um, but I still do a clean show and it's more of a choice now to do a clean show where back in the day was just, it was going to be a clean show because that's how I operated. Now it's like, I have to actually be conscious, like watch your mouth on stage. (laughs) So how did you grow up? Did you grow up in a Christian environment? Was it religious? That sort of thing? Did that sort of dictate your cleanness? Yeah, for sure. Um, So we grew up sort of Catholic at first. Um, I did like my first communion and a catechism um, in Catholic church. And then we were we were, we had to leave, I guess, because my parents got divorced. So I guess you can't be divorced in Catholic church is what it was. I don't know what happened. Um, so then my parents started going to Christian churches separately. 
And so then we started going to Christian churches and then going to youth camp and like all that kind of stuff. So from the time I was a teenager, I became sold out for Christ, super Christian, not having sex till I'm married. I'm not going to um, do bad things, say cuss words, I'm not going to drink and do drugs anymore. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah. And so that's kind of how I lived my life from my teenage years to like my adulthood. I did have my bad years, like 12, 13, 14, I was doing drugs. I was doing all the bad stuff when I was young. And then I started going to like youth camp and stuff and was like, well, maybe I probably shouldn't do drugs anymore. And then maybe I probably, I shouldn't say cusses. And then, um, yeah, then I became an adult and moved to Hollywood. And so I kind of had that mentality when I first started in Hollywood. So I was, I was very, very good girl in Hollywood. Very proper. Yeah. Did that get you anyway? I think so. I think I, I, it got me to where I am today, which I'm very grateful for. I'm sure there's a lot of things like I talk about in my book, this, you know, a lot of decisions that I made where I felt like I was trying to be a good Christian and um, probably I didn't need to make that decision. Like there was one movie that I was offered a role and um, I didn't do it because there was like a couple crude jokes in the script. And I was like, no, I'm not going to be a part of a movie that's doing jokes like this. Like I was on my high horse or whatever. And then come to find out it was not bad at all. It was actually pretty empowering. It's a movie called Pitch Perfect that I could have been in. But I was like, no, God wouldn't like that. God don't care. Maybe your church and your pastor might not, but God don't care. Oh, things like that. So I'm I'm grateful for my conservative years that kept me from STDs and unwanted pregnancies, but also kept me from some really great opportunities like Pitch Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, spewing right like the opportunity to be in Pitch Perfect. But then again, would you really be where you are today? You think if you didn't pass that up? Who knows. Who knows? I mean, there were a couple movies that I didn't do <laughs> that I probably should have, but who knows? Everything happens for a reason. You know what I mean? And I feel like there's not one path laid out for all of us. I think there's multiple paths. And if you decide to go left here, then you go left here. And then ultimately you're going to get to where you're going, but it's going to look a little different because you went left. If you would have went right, you're still going to get to where you're going, but it's going to look a little bit differently. Yeah. So. Who knows? Who knows if I would be where I am if I took those movies? How has your faith in Jesus evolved from, I guess, early years to navigating Hollywood to even now? Has it evolved? Have it become stronger? What do you think it's, it's sort of become at the moment? Definitely evolved. I've deconstructed a lot of what my beliefs were growing up yeah. and kind of took a step back and and looked at my faith what i believe and was like okay what if this is actual god and what is church culture yeah. what is you know mob mentality what mm -hmm. is a tradition that we've been holding on to that we we say is gospel but is actually not it's just tradition um what are the things that maybe we misinterpreted? What let's maybe look at the whole big picture and not just this new King James version or this message version or this one passage that pastor talked about, you know, in his sermon today, you know, like it's, it's definitely, my faith has definitely evolved. And as I have deconstructed and asked God all these questions, I feel like I've taken God out of the box that I have put him in for my whole life. Yeah. Basically, this is the box, God. Jesus, you look like this. You stay like this right here in this box. And the second I start removing the walls of this box, it's like, oh, wow, you don't look like how I thought you did. Oh, wow. All kinds of stuff. It's like 
so liberating. Um, it's so beautiful. It's empowering. It's like, this makes more sense. Yeah. Removing the box makes way more sense. And I get it. We don't have to fully understand God. How can we understand God? I remember they used to tell me in church too, like we can't understand the God of the universe with our little brains. Right. And back then I think it was a way to like, not be okay with questions that didn't have answers. Be okay. Be okay with questions that were like, well, that doesn't really make sense. Well, we're not supposed to, we're not meant to understand God is mysterious, like all of that. And it's like, part of that is true. Yes. And then the other part is like, that don't make no sense. <laughs> let's, let's take God out of the box and then go, Oh, this actually makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I grew up in a conservative Christian household, so I know exactly the box that you're talking about and all the the man sort of philosophies and, and teachings and the things you weren't allowed to do and, and growing up to the point where I am now is sort of deconstructing all those beliefs that I grew up with and trying to figure out, okay, is this God or is this actually man telling me because he's interpreted it as what God has said? And it's sort of like when when the veil is lifted from a lot of people's eyes, if they have been in that environment for such a long time, it's sort of like this liberating, freeing thing that you were talking about that it's like, oh, Jesus is not like that. He's like this. He's he wants us to to excel. He wants us to do these things. It's like it's not it's not what I thought he was. I've been yeah. living this kind of life for such a long time. Like, what's going on yeah. here? <laughs> so exactly. I completely understand where you're coming from on that point. Mm -hmm. And it can be scary too. Like yeah. some people it's very liberating and for others it's too scary. Like that's not how I grew up. That's not what I was taught. That's not, you know, what I've always believed. Like to, to walk away or to step away from something that you grew up believing is scary. Um, it feels very vulnerable to say something different than what the rest of your family says. Scary. It's a scary place to be. But um, I think like your question earlier, like what does peace look like? You know, sometimes yeah. peace looks like going into the scary for a second. Because where you're at comfortable actually doesn't feel peaceful. It's comfortable because um, it's familiar. It's I know how to do it this way. I know how to pray like this. I know how to say these words. I know how to quote scripture. I, I know how to speak Christianese. I know how to do that. It's familiar. So it's comfortable, but there's not a lot of peace in there. So when I step into the scary, the asking the questions, the removing God from the box. It feels scary, but it feels peaceful. So I'm always trying to follow peace, you know? I look at it the same way as trying to find the peace that passes all understanding. Like, because some things I don't understand. And you're right before how you were talking about how our finite minds, how can we really comprehend God and his teachings half the time? So a lot of things that we're listening to growing up, man has tried to interpret what God has said. And some things are easier than others, granted, but there's a lot in there that is sort of to be up to man's interpretation a little bit. Like it's, mm -hmm. it can be confusing sometimes uh, for a lot of people, but I try these days to search out for areas of my life or, or, or things in my life that bring about that peaceful understanding, even though it can be tricky and difficult to actually get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad it did. <laughs> you know, like, we we're going on a little tangent. It made sense in my brain. I'm like, hopefully it makes sense to Angela. <laughs> so, but I'm curious, like, what does it look like for you now being a person of faith in as a comedian in the Hollywood sphere, 
having removed God from the box, what does that really look like for you now? Um, I mean, it looks very similar. Like I, I've always operated my life with faith. I still operate my life with faith, but I think, um, life looks a little less rigid. I mean, and again, going back to my book, I have a book where I talk about fungula, like I I'm still Angela and it's just a little more fun. I'm just a little more relaxed. I'm a little more, Hey, listen, if not you say up a, yeah. If you say a cuss, guess what? You're not going to hell. And let's talk about hell. What, what do you think hell looks like? Like there's, I mean, you could go deeper and deeper and deeper, but I feel like I, I am at a place where I have a community that I love, where we all ask questions. My husband and I have a podcast with our friend, um, Brandon, and it's called Knights at the Round Table. And we talk about our deconstruction and our reconstruction of our ideas around faith, relationships, marriage, love, friendship, um, all of these things that we we had as like, these are staples flags in the ground this is how it works and how it doesn't work that we're like "Mm, not so sure about this and then we talk about that on our podcast and I'm so grateful for that community because you know when I first started asking questions and being like "Mm, I don't know about this I don't understand this Um, this doesn't feel right this does you know what I mean and I'm asking all these questions I would have certain books that I would go to certain podcasts that I would listen to that I was like searching for, am I the only one? No, I'm not the only one. There's actually people who have gone before me that have asked more questions and written books that I've been told, oh, don't read that book. Oh, you're going to fall away if you are caught reading, you know, one of these books. Uh, What is it? Love Wins? No. Is it Love Wins? I'm getting Bob Goff and what's his name mixed up. Um, but anyways, I remember there'd be certain books that if like you were reading that in church, people were like, oh, that's, they're walking the line now. Is it love you know? does? Love does. Thank yeah. you. Love does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I feel like um, my life looks similar, but yet more chill, you know? I like that. And as you were talking... Uh, I was, um, I got bitten by a mosquito <laughs> on, on my leg and I'm just like trying to focus while the pain is like going to my leg. <laughs> oh no, a skeeter um, got you. It got me. It got me good. Damn it. It's, it's winter here in, in, uh, blasted. Anyway, <laughs> I'll try. And- it's hot as hell over here. It's humid. It's nasty. It's like, a hundred degrees. And then it just starts pouring rain out of nowhere. It's gross. We had the last couple of days, it was just raining. So that's, I think where the mosquitoes have come from, but they love my blood. They just like constantly go for my legs all the time for whatever reason. Anyway, I digress into another topic altogether. (laughs) Um, I just thought it was funny how you're, you're talking about that love does. And here I am like trying to be in a live sacrificial you're the sacrificial lamb of this oh, podcast tell me about it like literally putting my <laughs> blood on the line here <laughs> anyway um your your book's called who do i think i am which i think is a pretty cool title actually uh stories of troller wishes can you tell me about that a chola is like a mexican tough gangbanger type chick Um, and I always wanted to be that when I was younger, I wanted to be tough. I wanted to like write in low riders and, you know, I, I wanted that tough cholo life. Um, but that was not how I was raised. Like I wanted that street cred, you know, I wanted to be like tough girl. And I would ask my mom and be like, mom, do we have any family members in prison? Cause I wanted like some street cred so I could like tell people I had, I had family members that were locked up. And she'd be like, no, we're, what? No, we're not that family. <laughs> um, but I wanted it, man. I wanted to be a chola real bad. Um, and so I grew up, I didn't speak Spanish growing up. I was Mexican-American. I didn't speak Spanish. Um, 
So it just, it didn't work for me, even though that's what I, I wanted. And I lived in Silicon Valley where, you know, that's where Facebook is now and, and all of that. But back in the day, it was like all the emerging tech companies were there. And um, I didn't want to be a CEO. I didn't want to be an engineer. I wanted to be a chola. I wanted to go cruising with my friends in a low rider car um, with hydraulics. Z, Z, Z. I want to be with hydraulics, but nope, didn't work. Oh, excuse you, sir. I am on a podcast. He agrees with you. Sir, calm down. You're okay, sir. Um, so who do I think I am is stories of self-identity, growing up Mexican-American, but I didn't speak Spanish, wanted to be a chola real bad, but it didn't work out. But it's also who do I think I am to dream such big dreams, to have the audacity to say something like I want to be an actress when I didn't know anything about being an actress. Like, who do I think I am to be living this life so freely? Who do I think I am to be a stand-up comedian? Who do I think who do I think I am to write a book? Like all of that. So it's who do I think I am? Self-identity and chasing my dreams. Like the audacity. Did you end up getting the low rider car? Not yet, but I do hope for one one day. I'm 40 years old. Maybe by the time I'm 50, maybe my 50th birthday, I'll get a low rider. I would love an Impala, like a 64 Impala with like hydraulics. That would be dream come true. It's on the list. 50th birthday. Yeah. We'll see it on yeah. Instagram. She'll make a, a video of her just cruising along. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I like it. What was the what was the most challenging part of you writing a book? I mean, it's no easy thing writing a book. What mm. was was it difficult for you or did you find it come naturally? Um, I'm a storyteller, so that helps. Um my stand-up comedy is very storytelling style. So um, I think the most difficult part, um, deciding how vulnerable I wanted to be in the book. Like I would put it out there and then I'd be like, ooh, do I really want to say this? Do I really want to share this story? Um, and then honestly, there were parts where I wanted to be even more honest and more real, but it was like, you know what? Not for this book. I like kind of using my my intuition and and being like, sure, I could say this, but does it need to be said? Yeah. Does this need to be said right now? So it was, it was constant balance of what do I include and what do I not include in my memoir, in this first book about my life. Um, I've always wanted to write the book. I've had uh, a document on my computer for 10 years where um, I would say if I ever had a book, this would be my chapters. This would be what I would talk about. And I would try stories on stage and they just, some stories wouldn't work on stage for stand up because in stand up comedy, we are caught, we are taught to cut the fat, which means take yeah. details out. You want to get to your punchline as quick as possible. So you want to take out all the details. But there are some stories that I had that all the details were really important. They really help paint the picture. They really help you see and feel where I was at at that point in my life and the story that I'm telling. So I'd be like, you know what? This story does not work in stand up form. I'm going to keep it for a book one day. And so I had this document where I would throw these stories in, like, I'm going to tell the story in a book one day. And um, I used to speak at girls' conferences and women's conferences, a lot of Christian events. And I would share my testimony with people. And people were very inspired and very encouraged. And, and I was like, you know, I'm going to write a book one day and I'm going to share my testimony in a book, but it's not going to be like a Christian book, a Christian testimony book. I wanted it to be for everyone, which is what my stand-up comedy is. My stand-up comedy does not cater to one group of people. My stand-up comedy is very open to the world. Everybody is welcome. And I'm probably going to talk about all of you anyway, when you get there, you know what I mean? And so I wanted my book to be the same thing. Like, yes, I want to share my story about my faith and how my faith has evolved, but I want it to be inclusive. You don't have to be Christian to read the book. You don't have to be Mexican to read the book. You don't have to be a comedian to read the book. You don't have to be anything. You can be you and you'll probably see some of yourself in my story because I'm just your 
typical girl. You know what I mean? Like I'm just a girl, just like you, just a boy. And we're human. You know, we all have our own questions, our own, you know, trauma that we grew up with. And so even if my trauma wasn't your trauma, you can connect on the fact that you probably had trauma like, oh, wow, she went through some shit, too. OK, wow. You know, so I wanted my book to be that for people. Yeah, I sort of you want you're not forcing anyone to believe anything that you're putting out there. You're just sharing your story. Mm hmm. Yes which is powerful in a, in and of itself. And I sort of found that for my first book too. So like, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I want people to know, but how am I going to do that? That's not forceful in a way that doesn't tell people you should believe this. Uh, it's going to turn them off straight away. So it's just sharing your your testimony really. And like you said, the traumas that we can all relate with and mm -hmm. hopefully they can take something away from it. So yeah, yeah I, I I can connect with that side of things with writing a book. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to ask you about your most vulnerable moment in your life. When was that? Oh man, I don't know. My most vulnerable? I don't know. That's hard. I mean... My profession is pretty vulnerable. Yeah. You get on stage in front of hundreds, sometimes thousands of people, and you attempt to make them laugh. Um, it's a vulnerable place to be. Um, deconstructing, cutting ties with things that I once believed that I no longer believe, like that's a very vulnerable place. Um those are the things that come to my mind. I don't know what would be like the most vulnerable, but I would say standing on stage in front of thousands of people with just you and a microphone and having all these people listen to you, their eyes, everybody's looking at you. Everybody's not only waiting for you to say words, but waiting for you to say words that make them laugh. Like you would think that's a lot of pressure in a very vulnerable spot to be in. Luckily, I'm all, I'm all right at it. So when I get up there on that stage, I do okay. I do all right. But um, at first it wasn't, it wasn't always that way. Every show is not the best, so. Have you ever bombed? Oh my God. One time, my probably my worst bombing story. I, was booked for a corporate event and corporate events are known for two things. Great money, horrible audience, horrible show. They, they're not here to see comedy. They're here because they had a work event. They were supposed to be here. Um, this particular one was a, a party, a company party that was in Las Vegas. They had all, it was a trucking company. So it's mostly men, like 85, 90% men that work for this company. Whoever booked me, I don't know what they were thinking. Like I definitely, you know, have a strong female following, not so much a big trucker following. Uh, but whoever booked me was like, oh, they're going to love her. So not only was I just the wrong person to book for this group of people, but they had this group of people at the bar with a DJ, everybody's dancing, drinking, have a good time. The lights are dim, you know, it's like a vibe. And then they shuffle everyone into this conference room with these like bright, ugly lights overhead and empty banquet tables. And they're like, okay, and now we're going to see a comedian. And they were not having it at all. So my opener that I brought, he's a dude. So I was like, well, at least they'll like him because he's a dude. He gets up there and he bombs. And I was like, oh, wow, if he's going to bomb. Oh, wait, wait till you see what I got coming. I was supposed to be up there for 45 minutes. I was up there for maybe about 20 minutes. 
of no laughs, just plowing through my material, no laughs. I started doing like all my Oakland Raiderette jokes when I used to be a professional cheerleader for the Oakland Raiders. I'm like, well, you know, guys like football, so they'll like this at least. Nope, no laughs. Then I just start making fun of myself. And I was like, listen, you guys, I didn't book me for this event. I don't want me to be here either. Like this is, and I just start like making fun of myself. And then I start making fun of the lady who booked me. And so for the next few minutes, I get a little bit of laughs as I make fun of me and her. And then I ask her, I'm like, do you want me to keep going? And she was like, it's okay. So I was supposed to do 45 minutes. I did about 25 and got off stage and that was it. And then I went home and I was like, that was the most uncomfortable situation ever. Awful. And have you done many of those corporate events since? Um, not too many. I have, I, I enjoy a good corporate event when I'm the right person for the job and it's the right situation. You know, like that was not a great, they did not plan that well. Like if anything, like have me come first and then say, go to the party afterwards, you know, but when it's the right situation, it works out. It's pretty good. Do you plan a lot of your sets? Do you change it up a lot of the time or do you keep it sort of, sort of consistent? On my tour, I, I keep my show, my show. I know the way it starts and I know the way it ends. Um, the only time I switch it up is if it is like, oh, we're doing 20, you're going to do a 20 minute set. Then I pick my 20 minutes that I'm doing um, stuff like that. But for the most part, when I have my show done, I do it the same way beginning to end when I'm working it out and trying new material, then that's different. Then every show is going to be a little bit different because I'm, I'm figuring out what my next hour is going to be. And how do you sort of come up with new jokes and find the rhythm with that? Because I guess every audience would be different, right? And how they respond to that particular joke. So if it doesn't stick, Mm. what do you normally do with that? You just keep going or. Yeah. So I try different things in, in the comedy club and, um, I take more liberties in the comedy club. And if it doesn't work, then I go to a joke that does work and I get everybody back and then I'll try something new. And then hopefully it works. If it doesn't work, then I jump into a joke that I know works. Um, and just start building material that way. And sometimes I'll do a joke that I know works, but then I'll like veer off on the topic and just go down a couple rabbit holes and see where that takes me, start talking to the audience a little bit. So it feels like, oh, she's just improvising this whole thing, but there's part of it that's a written joke that I know works. And the other part of it is me searching a gold mine, like looking for gold in the audience. What's gonna help me grow this joke to be instead of three minutes, now it's five minutes. Instead of five minutes, now it's eight minutes, you know, like I have these punchlines written, but also let me talk to this section over here. And then sometimes you come up with gold and you're like, yes, I'm going to take that to my next show. and I'm going to try this whole thing again. What do you think is uh, your best joke? Well, my most popular joke is the nail salon bit that has hundreds of millions of views on the interweb. Um... For me, my favorite joke to do is whatever joke is my new joke. Whatever joke is my new big laugh, that's my favorite joke to do. Not the new joke that I'm still working out and finding my way, but the new joke that I'm doing that all of a sudden has become a crusher. It becomes everybody's loving it. That's my new favorite joke to do because it's fresh to me. I haven't been doing it for years, but I know it gets a good laugh. So every time I gear up to do a joke that's like that it's like i feel invigorated and it gives it like more life when i'm telling the joke because i'm having a good time telling it how do you come up with your jokes do you sort of look at other comedians and what they're doing or do you just sort of no i just i just talk about my life and my experiences like my favorite joke that I'm doing right now, the one that's getting a really big laugh that's new that I just started doing earlier, earlier this year is a joke about uh, my first tornado warning experience as I'm a California girl who's moved to the South, who now lives in Nashville. We didn't get tornadoes in California. 
and I had my very first tornado warning experience. And so I talk about that from beginning to end and like a fish out of water. Everybody loves a fish out of water story. And so it's like all the craziness that I have no idea what I'm doing in this situation. And there's something it's funny for anybody who's never been in a tornado, but especially for those who have Mm -hmm. all the points that I'm hitting are so familiar. Familiarity is funny. Um, so it's a familiar point to some people. And the fact that I've never experienced it in my point of view about what we're experiencing now, they're laughing even harder at my naiveness about the whole situation. So, um, that whole story is probably one of my favorite stories to tell right now, because whether you've experienced a tornado or not, you you definitely relate to my not knowing what to do in this situation. If someone wants to become a comedian themselves and they're on the up and coming, they're trying to work it out, what sort of advice would you give to them? Um, so it really depends on like where they're at. You just want to try it for the first time you've never done it. I took a joke writing class and that really helped me because I learned tips, tools, techniques, etiquette, things that I did not know. And I would have never, I could figure out after a while, like, oh, you have to actually shake the host's hand when you get on stage. You have to acknowledge the host. Like not everybody would notice that comedians do that. They just switch places, but you didn't notice that they shook hands really quick Mm -hmm. or they hugged or they did something. They acknowledged each other. Little things like that. I learned in this class. So um, I would say take a class if you've never done it before and you're like, oh, maybe I want to try it. Go find a joke writing class and and see how that works. Um, If you have been writing jokes for a while and you've been getting up at open mics, getting some stage time, I would say uh, my advice that I love to give people, whether you're an aspiring stand-up or or aspiring baker or CEO or engineer, is do you and do you well. Don't try to be anybody else but you. Don't try to be the comic who went up before you. Don't try to be the comic you just saw last night on Netflix. Don't try to be anybody but you. Have your own point of view, your own perspective on what you're talking about. And when you get on stage, go do you and do you well. Show up for yourself to the best of your ability. Because if you show up and you're like holding back because you're doubting yourself or you're scared or whatever, you're not doing anybody a favor because they're not going to respond to you. And then you just shot yourself in the foot. So why would you do that? So show up for yourself to the best of your ability and do you, don't try to be anybody else. Do you and do you well, which is also a chapter in my book. Ah, well, there you go. There's a little bit more of an insight for you into getting the book people. Yes. (laughs) If that interests you at all, I'm, I'm, Loving this conversation. I've got a couple more questions for you, Angela, if you don't mind. Sure. How did you win the heart of Manny, your husband? Oh, let's see. Um, He says because I was good at what I did and I was out of debt. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, When our mutual friend called him, And was like, hey, I want to hook you up with somebody. She sent a video of me to him. And he was like, I don't date Mexican girls. What are you doing? Like, because he like white girls only. And um, he was like, I don't date Mexican girls. And he's like, just check her out. Right. I think you would like her. Um, She loves God and she's out of debt. And that was big for him because he was also out of debt. He worked very hard as a balloon animal man, making balloon animals at restaurants by Disney World so he could pay off his college debt. And so that was very important to have somebody who was wise with their money um, because he was also wise with his money. So he was like, oh, intrigued. He was like, oh, okay, let me take a look. And he says, if he would have saw my comedy and didn't think I was funny, it wouldn't have worked in the same way he does music. And he's like, if I was dating somebody and she didn't like my music, it wouldn't work. So I had to think that you were good at whatever you did. So whether I was a singer, he had to think I was a good singer because he's like, you can't be doing something as a profession or aspiring to do it. And I'm like, Oh God, this girl is awful. Like how are you going to date somebody like that? So to him, I was good at what I did and I was out of debt. And that was the first things that, piqued his interest. 
Um, and then he will also say that he heard God say, I trust her. And so he's like, well, if God can trust her, then I can trust her. I mean, two big things. She's good at what she does and she's out of debt. That's a big, big trust factor. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I like that story. And who he made the first move, obviously. And was it sort of like sunshine and rainbows for you or? Oh, it went really fast. Um, although in the beginning, um, he says that I was making him pay for someone else's mistakes with there may be a little bit of truth to that, but I say that he's just used to girls fawning all over him because he's so hot. And I was not trying to do that. I was like, whatever. Um, so it might've been a little bit of both, but so in the beginning, like our first date that we went on, he was like, I was about to fake a stomach ache and leave because you were so cold. And then I ended up warming up. Um, and so I, I saved the date. And, um, yeah, we moved quickly. We met in August. We were engaged by Christmas Eve and then we got married the next June. So we didn't even know each other for a full year before we got married. And how long have you been married for now? 11 years. Goodness me. Can you believe it? Yeah. It's amazing. I know. When you know, you know, when you've been around the block, you've been around the block. You know what I mean? You're like, no, I've done this already. I, I think there's something different here. Yeah, no point in wasting any time. If you know, you know. Right, right, yeah, right. right. Then, then the thing is, like, how do you know? That's always made me wonder. Like, how is, is, is it a feeling inside? Thing. Like, yep. It's that cliche when you know, you know, like something's different. And like, I'm an avid journaler. I love to journal. And I remember journaling during that season. And I knew I loved him, but I wouldn't say it. And I couldn't even bring myself to write it in my journal, even though I knew it. I remember finally writing it in my journal and being like, okay, I think I love this guy. But I knew already I did. I knew like weeks before it just took me that long to like be honest with myself and say it. It was like something just felt different. So I'll look for the feeling then. I'll yeah, you got to look for the feeling and don't ignore the red flags for sure. Because you could have a feeling and just red flag everywhere. Boop, 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 boop. You're like, oh, but I'm in love. <laughs> Did he have any red flags? No, no red flags. None. Oh, good thing. Yeah. I was speaking with someone the other day about red flags. Mm -hmm. and it's like the red flags are there for a reason. Like you shouldn't ignore them. But then right. again, like what kind of red flags are they? The distinction between are they ones where you can work on or that person is willing to work on them or sure. they're ones that they're not. And it's just going to like, you don't compromise for that at all. Right. That was an interesting conversation actually. But anyway, <laughs> I digress yeah. again. Uh, what do you love the most about yourself and your story? What do I love the most about myself? Um, I love the way I love people. Um, I love my friends and my family. Um, the way I love strangers, I feel empathetic towards people. Um, I use my intuition when I meet people in meet and greets and Sometimes the meet and greet can be very quick and very just, hi, nice to meet you. Let's take a picture. Cheese, thank you for coming. Have so much fun. Bye. Sometimes it's just a quick meet and greet like that. And other times I feel like I'm listening to God and I say what I hear. Yeah. And so sometimes I'll be in a meet and greet and I'll meet a couple and I'll just say to this guy, Hey, you're a good dad. And his wife will be like, he is a good dad. And I'll be like, you, I can tell you got a good spirit about you. And I feel like those words carry weight with people. And I could easily just be like, hi, nice to meet you. Cheese. Thank you. Have so much fun. But when I hear God whisper things, I feel like I need to do my part and whisper things to them because I feel like that's love yeah. and who wouldn't want to feel love, you know? 
Um, so I, I would definitely say that I love the way that I love people, my family, my friends and strangers. Um, and what I love most about my story, um, I would say how colorful it is, the ups and downs, the good days, the bad days, the heartbreak, the insane victories that I would never have imagined for myself. Um, the fact that I get to do what I get to do, it's incredible. Coming from where I've come from, getting mm -hmm. to do what I get to do. It's pretty where, incredible. Sorry, I should have let you finish there. Um, yeah. Where can people find you and connect with you and get a copy of your book, Angela, before I ask you the final question? Uh, people can find me all over social media. I'm most active on Instagram, to be honest. That's where I mostly reply to people um, things like that. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Facebook. I'm on all the things. Is this your baby? Oh my God. My baby. She's coming. <laughs> Come on. Hi, up, 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 up. On the bed. Oh, yeah. Now my dog's head peeks up because he hears me use his voice for someone else. Flynn! Oh, look at that paw. Look at that dapper baby. Yeah. Oh, friend. You're making Boy or girl? It's a girl. Her name's Alita Joy. Look at that little lady, just like, <laughs> here's my hand for you. I'm She's a lady. Like, Come on, Jay, I want to go for a walk. You're taking too oh, long. <laughs> baby. Um, but yes, I'm all over social media. My website is Angela.com, A-N-J-E-L-A-H.com. You can see my touring schedule there. You can see all my social media links there. You can buy my merchandise there. Check out my podcast there. Um, everything about me is pretty much on my website, Angela.com. I'll make sure you can get my book knows. there too, my book. Your book too, amazing. And I'll make sure everyone knows where to get it. Links be in the show notes below for people. This is my final question for you, Angela. Can't believe I'm already getting to this point because I feel like I talk to you for hours because so many questions, but yeah. it's a hypothetical one. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. Okay. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. Um, They've been able to get it and show it to you on your hundredth birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Do they, do they hear all the parts, even when I'm having secret conversations? Everything. Everything. Okay. Now what, what do I want that movie to say well i mean i guess it's going to say everything that i've said pretty much what do you personally want i know they're going to get it all i mean i hope personally... good things yeah i hope i mean it, that movie's it's going to be a tearjerker it's going to be hilarious it's going to be surprising it's going to be all the things it's going to be a roller coaster of emotions that that 100th birthday party is going to be just roller coaster for sure. I'd watch it 100%. <laughs> as you yeah, thank alive you. At that point. <laughs> but um, Angela, it's been an absolute delight and, and a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for your stories, your comedy, your wisdom, your advice, and just for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me.